Good morning to our wonderful audience and uh, thank you again for joining us. Uh, the third day of the Offshore Investment Managers webinar. Always great to have you all with us and we thank you for your continued contribution as always. And thank you Olga for that lovely upbeat music with a great lineup of global managers knocking on our doors this morning. And hopefully we can leave here walking on sunshine at the end of the session. Uh, they're all here to share their views on the world and how they continue to identify great opportunities for our investors. On screen now is the agenda for the day, where we will cover a lot of ground on global macro, value and quality, or a bit of both, perhaps uh, global property and emerging markets. All the presentations and recordings of all three days are and will be shared on the Boutique Manager's website. So you're more than welcome to access it there afterwards. If not sure where to find it, uh, give us a shout to any of the BCI sales team members and we'll gladly guide you to exactly where they are. As always, you're welcome to post your questions in the Q&A bubble and we will try to get to as many of our questions as we can. There are numerous factors or macro factors that may very well impact on company earnings and consumers globally. Some of the more recent factors is Japan and the UK recording technical recessions. But what about the US or are they just heading for a Goldilocks economy? With US core retail sales contracting, as the clock struck midnight for the US consumer, and by definition for the U.S. business cycle. And what does this mean for the U.S. and other regions like emerging markets? Does it matter or do we just stick to good fundamental analysis when investing? That said, it is my great pleasure to welcome our first presenter of the day on global macro and global equity all the way from London. Early start there is Jared Khan. Head of Equities at Credo, managing funds at the intersection of value and quality. Good morning, Jared. How are you keeping? I'm very well, Eugene. How are you doing? Fantastic. And thank you for the early start again on your side. We really appreciate it uh, and your time and joining us. Uh, we're really looking forward to your views and how you see things come together in your global equity fund. Thanks, Eugene. I'm, uh, it's always a pleasure to be uh, with you, no matter how early the start is. And uh, hopefully I can impart some, uh, some, some wisdom on, on you guys. But I think it's very much the same story that you hear from me all the time. But um, consistency is what we do. Uh, but anyway, let's give it a go. And uh, hopefully you'll enjoy the presentation. Yeah, thanks. OK, so Olga, if we could just start with the first slide. Um, I think it's quite important just to go back and recap where we were at the beginning of 2023. We are not a macro house. We don't really take you know, significant views on economies and, and we don't wait on, on Wednesdays and Thursdays for PPI and CPI and labor markets and things like that. We kind of, as Eugene um, expressed, we try and buy great quality businesses, which we believe um, are undervalued. And that's kind of our mantra when we talk about buying value uh, or buying quality companies at this section of value and quality. But going back to the beginning of 2023, um, you know, there was doom and gloom around. It was a bruising year 2022 for every asset class. I mean, equities got um, absolutely hammered, in particular, long duration assets, um, growth, uh, technology, nonprofit tech. Um, and the bond world was actually probably on a relative basis, worse. Uh, we had a significant surge in interest rates that caught bond and equity investors off guard, and um, you know U.S. Treasuries or Treasuries around the world, and 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 um, corporate debt got absolutely slammed. So we had a year uh, where you know world markets were down twenty percent plus, and um, there was just huge fears of inflation, and that this inflation pressure would continue to to push economies into a, a bit of a tailspin. And I think most um, investors who got caught in 22 um, were positioned for a, a similar type of scenario going into uh, 2023. But um, if we just move to the next slide, things turned out very differently. 
In fact, um, this, the fears um, that we had of inflation appeared to moderate sooner than anticipated, certainly in the US, um, and things have calmed down quite um, significantly across Europe as well. And the Fed, um, you know, lifted rates multiple times during that period um, and, and did a great job in terms of balancing the kind of cooling the economy at the same time as not killing um, the economy and obviously looking after inflation. So we got to this kind of Goldilocks environment, the soft landing, and ultimately this re was rewarded by um, higher stock prices and, and in particular, and I'll, I'll focus on this later, indices that went higher. And so we had, again, you know, the MSCI, the S&P, all of these indices up 20 to 23 percent plus. So it was actually a completely different year to what was potentially anticipated going into uh, 2023. And we call it, you know, the year of rainbows and butterflies. So if we just move to the next slide, I guess, you know, we need to go back in history. And I, I always go back to this graph because Ultimately, we are very much more correlated, um, our fund and our investment style to value um, rather than certainly growth. And it's important to, to look at the relationship of value and growth and how um, they have um, mixed uh, and matched to each other over the last you know, 50 years. And you've probably seen the slide before, but if we just focus on the slide, you'll see every time the blue line goes down, um, it is when value outperforms growth. And every time the blue line goes up, it is when growth outperforms value. So in the period from 1975 to uh, just before the tech bubble of 2000, value was absolutely a winning strategy. Then you had this big um, resurgence in, in 98, 99, where tech you know, um, got a little bit out of hand and then a significant sell-off as we know. And I just highlight the red rings uh, in 99 and again in 2020 uh, and the period that we're in in 2023, only to say that we know that, um, you know, growth has been the outperformer for the last 15 years. It was a significant outperformer during COVID. And, and then we saw the, um, the harsh realities or what happens in a frothy interest rate environment when rates go up quickly and value significantly underperformed, sorry, growth significantly underperformed in 22. Uh, but interestingly, what's happened in 23 is we've seen, again, this massive resurgence of growth um, against value. And, and I'm just pointing out, you know, this may continue uh, for another period of time. I'm not trying to bash growth. I'm not trying to bash the Magnificent Seven, They're great companies, but you're getting to levels and correlations where at some stage we think there is some kind of mean reversion likely to happen. And that could either mean that you have a sell-off in, in high growth stocks, or you just have a period of where high growth stocks underperform and the rest of the market kind of uh, gets back to some kind of uh, level of, of ascendancy. We can just move to the next slide, thanks. So, um, you know, 2023 was, again, a good year on paper, but when you break it down in terms of sectors that performed well, um, it's kind of almost the inverse of 2022. So um, the best performing sectors, as, as I've mentioned, are, are stocks in the technology sector, but semiconductor stocks. So NVIDIA, uh, in auto space, Tesla, media, Alphabet and Meta, software, <clears throat> Um, and tech companies like Apple. And then in retail, that's all exclusively basically Amazon. So um, as you can imagine, the Magnificent Seven really pushing the market there. And then on the flip side, when you look at the stocks that perform badly, those are all really defensive low beta stocks, utilities, um, beverages, uh, energy, et cetera, et cetera. So a really a, a divergence in returns. And as I say, you know, if you were, in a defensive portfolio or in value portfolio, your, your year, although it would have been positive, wouldn't have been uh, nearly as sensational as some of the returns that we saw in some of the growth funds around, um, around the world. The next slide, please. So I've alluded to this already. Um, you know, although the indices did very well in 23, um, we can't move away from the fact that we had this broad rally, or so I should say narrow rally, um, that was driven by the Magnificent Seven, these seven amazing stocks. And, you know, you can't do anything but admire these companies. They are a different type of growth stock, to put it um, uh, differently. Big, very profitable, 
average net profit margin for the last three years of over 22%. Um, but what is a bit worrying is just seeing how quickly and how big these companies have grown in such a small pass space of time, you know, $3 trillion added to their market cap since October, 2023, uh, just in the beginning of 24 alone, an extra 1 trillion has been added. And, and the more worrying factor is these stocks now contribute approximately 50% of the entire NASDAQ index. So when you're buying the index, you're buying predominantly these seven stocks. Next slide, Olga. Um, and, and if we strip it back just to valuation, um, this is kind of something we need to be cognizant of. Um, and the blue line is the PE multiple of the Magnificent Seven alone, which uh, you can see at the beginning of December 22 was trading very much in line with the, um, the S&P. Uh, you strip it out, you can see uh, these stocks now trade on maybe 30 times, 28.5 times PE, whereas the rest in the S&P, X the Magnificent Seven trade on about 18 times. So, and 18 times isn't too bad. Um, but um, one has to just question whether trees can grow to the sky and whether you just need to be a little bit more defensive when, when positioned in these kind of, kind of companies. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and again, just I think um, reiterating the theme, and it's all about mean reversion and just looking at relative valuations. What I've done here is I've just looked at um, the, the forward PE of, of various styles. So the black line being value, the purple line being the MSCI uh, total return, uh, or, and the blue line being growth. And what's interesting is if you look at the, the re-rating um, in these, in these um, various strategies, it's all come predominantly, or should I say the performance, um, has all come in the, um, in the re-rating of the, of the growth sector. So although you've had earnings growth, in fact, I had a different graph in here, which I pulled out a little bit earlier. Um, <clears throat> if you had compared value and growth, earnings growth per annum was approximately the same, around seven to 8%, but the divergence in returns has all come in the multiple expansion in growth versus value. So value going back to 2005, you know, was trading on about 13, 14 times. Today, value is trading on a similar kind of multiple, you know, around 14 times. If you look at growth, was trading around 16 times, now trading closer to 30. So you can see where a lot of that return has come from. And the question you've got to ask yourself is, are we in a paradigm shift? You know, are we in an interest rate environment? Or, or do you believe that these growth companies, particularly the Magnificent Seven, are so superior and have such a runway because of AI and other things, that they have the sustainable uh, advantage to retain, uh, if not increase, their multiples going forward. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> um, similar slide, but just again, reinforcing the difference in types of um, PE multiple valuation. And, and the only thing I would add here is that if you look at the blue line, uh, the two lines, the dark blue and the light blue, uh, the global equity fund is highly correlated to value. And when we talk about being, um, you know, at the intersection of value and quality, you can see that um, we've always had a multiple very much in line with, with the value index. And that gives us um, a margin of safety and a margin of comfort. And so in periods of time like 2023, 20, where um, you have a, you know, euphoric rise in growth, we don't capture all of that upside. But in other periods of time, like in 2022, we massively outperform the market because of our defensive nature and the strategies we employ. Uh, next slide, please, Olga. Um, again, just looking at the various correlations between uh, the Credo Global Equity Fund with the MSCI world, uh, the MSCI value and the MSCI growth. The growth um, being the gray line, the dark blue being value and uh, the light blue being credo. And um, this is what we call our yin and yang slide. We are very heavily correlated to value. So when value goes up, we go up. When value goes down, we go down. But what's quite pleasing is that we've still managed to quite significantly outperform the value index. And I think the reason for that is, you know, potentially superior stock picking. Uh, but also the qualitative overlay that we have in our fund. Um, but, you know, just a, a warning or a message to investors out there, 
if you um if you want to be in growth we are just not the you know, we're not the fund for you we are almost inversely correlated to growth next slide please uh yeah um again another slide uh, that you've seen before if you just press through i'll go to yeah um you know how we think about stock selection and returns um we don't look at stocks alone. We look at uh, expected total return or a TRR, and that's made up of three different components. We have an earnings per share growth, which again is made up by looking at the sales growth of the company, profit margins, share buybacks. We look at the, the multiple re-ratings or the, the multiples of stocks. And again, that is um, based on relative and absolute valuation. Um, we look at sentiment. We look at where we are in the cycle. And we are very strong believers in mean reversion. And then the last aspect is the dividend yield. Um, you know, we like to buy stocks that have strong free cash flow. We have strong balance sheets and um, where we can have some kind of secure dividend yield. And ultimately, you know, all the stocks we own, we try and find uh, positions where if you add the earnings per share growth, uh, potential multiple re-rating and that free cash flow dividend yield or, or share buyback, you get to a TRR, you know, somewhere in the mid teens um, or high teens. Um, and again, it's a relative gain. You know, if the if the S and P is giving you a multiple of say eighteen times, but only giving you earnings growth of say eight percent, we're happy to buy companies that are also on eighteen times, but giving you earnings per share growth on fifteen percent. So again, it's a it's a relative gain. But hopefully, that gives you again a snapshot of how we think of um, returns and and future returns. Um, okay, I'll go. Yeah. So. Just lastly, finish off, you know, in terms of positioning, um, we're not a macro house. It's been a difficult year, I think, for value generally last year, although positive returns. So how we position going forward. So, you know, the Goldilocks environment, the soft landing, I think has happened. Uh, we've had a divergence in returns in terms of, um, you know, tech companies, Magnificent Seven versus the rest of the market. But ultimately, you know, we continue buying great quality companies. Uh, we, we remain underweight tech. You can see uh, in our top 10 holdings, we still own Microsoft, but it's the only tech company we own in our top 10. We still own Meta. We did actually add um, Google Alphabet um, during the course of the year, um, but we still have quite a heavy weighting towards financials. I would just reiterate, these are not banks. These are quite diverse uh, financial companies. Progressive Corp is our top holding. It's an auto insurer in the U.S., it reaches all-time highs every night. Um, a similar company in the UK, Admiral Group. Again, it's not a financial, it's an auto insurer. Uh, we still have quite a healthy um, <coughs> exposure to healthcare uh, through HTA, through Cigna, through Humana. Uh, we recently added Diageo to the portfolio and increased it. We think Diageo screens very um, cheaply right now. Uh, the energy sector has been beaten down during the course of the year. We like Shell. We still think it's a fantastic company with significant free cash flow and, um, and trades at a big discount to its US peer group. Um, and Ryanair, you would notice, uh, is, is a relatively new um, addition to the portfolio, as is AutoZone. Uh, two great companies which we think have got um, significant long-term track records, compounders, and should outperform um, through the longer term. In terms of geographic exposure, still quite heavily weighted towards the US and um, a little bit more overweight towards the UK. And when we talk about the UK, I think it's important to point out that these companies are not UK centric businesses. These are global businesses that just happen to be listed um, on the UK market. So we're not taking a bet on the UK economy at all. In fact, we have very few UK specific stocks in the portfolio. Um, we think it's going to be a, a difficult year. I don't think the returns are going to be as, as um, strong as they were last year. And I think it's a year maybe you need to just buckle down and be a little bit more defensive. Okay, Eugene, that's me. Jared, thank you so much for that. Uh, maybe sticking to that slide in terms of your regional allocation. Uh, and I mean, you, you made the point quite clear. You are bottoms up stock selectors. Uh, from a regional point of view, you don't look at the macros. That doesn't determine uh, the regions that you allocate in. Stocks rather come to you. Um, you normally, you, well, you do have a bigger concentration in the US, uh, but you did pick up, I think, a bit more UK exposure. 
Uh, maybe just talk us through how did your regional exposure change the past year and why? Yeah, I mean, it, it's not significant. I think if you go back uh, to our presentation, I think it was September, we were still quite close to 25% in the UK. Um, I think where it's changed somewhat is uh, we we reduced the US maybe down to 55 and we just increased it back to, okay. back to 60. So um, it, it, it we, you know, it, uh, it hasn't changed that significantly. We've added one or two, um, you know, Irish listed stocks as it happens, you know, Flutter, uh, what we've had for a long time and Ryanair trades on the Irish exchange. Um, so that kind of skews things somewhat, but um, it hasn't been, it's been very subtle. Let's put it that way. I don't think there's been any um, any significant change. Diageo has been a, a big addition to the portfolio and that's increased our UK exposure, uh, but there hasn't been anything else obvious in there. Yeah. Being in London, I have to ask, and, and in the same breath, I have to mention, you know, economists do speak in riddles. Uh, the UK in a technical recession, but the question I think rather, you know, is the UK economy stagnating? Uh, are consumers getting richer or poorer? And what's the impact on some of the consumer type companies that you hold? Yeah, I mean, you can look at the stats and and I just feel it on the, I feel it myself. I feel it on the streets. I talk to my colleagues. There's no question that we've got poor over the last uh, 18 to 24 months. Interest rates yeah. have gone up. Our mortgage rates have gone up. Uh, yeah. food, food prices have gone up. It's costing you 30 to 50% more to eat out. Um, and there's no question that people don't have as much cash as they had before. Uh, but having said that, uh, I look at some of the retail data and some of the stocks we own and some of the stocks we look at. And um, you know, next, um, JD Sport, well, JD Sport had a profit warning, but some of these companies just continue to to surprise me on the upside, and the question is how much longer it can happen. So I don't know if it's kind of the um, uh, you know the imbalance between uh, consumer demand and, and maybe supply uh, that's coming through, but I think ultimately we we're going to be struggling in the UK for the foreseeable future, and I think retail um, is a difficult sector to be in, and you've got to be quite specific about you know the elements in retail that you want to be in. Definitely. Uh, maybe the last question, Jared, and I'm stealing a bit of time here. Uh, you mentioned, you know, your value bias approach, uh, but again, the intersection of value uh, and quality. Uh, there's so many global equity funds out there to choose from. Why Credo Global Equity now? Um, I think consistency in terms of our philosophy. Um, we quite boring in terms of our presentations. I keep saying the same thing over <laughs> and over again. I think you should take confidence from that. You look at uh, yes. you look at our positioning, you look at uh, our correlations. If you want uh, a, a value biased fund that uh, does what it says on the tin, then that's what you're going to get from us. And I think uh, people should really take comfort from that. Jared, thank you so much again for your time this morning. It's really great to have you on our sessions as always uh, and i do agree that high level of consistency is always there when we speak with you and deal with you thank you so much again for the great work you do and that of your team we'll uh, chat to you again in the very near future pleasure thanks eugene right your audience bci credo global equity feeder fund is open on the most platforms as janet showed on that last slide as well Right, for our next session, it is my privilege to welcome Andreas Jan van der Horst from Marzi Asset Management. Andreas, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, we thank you for your time and really great to have you with us. How are you keeping? Great, thank you, Eugene. Good morning, everyone. Good, we're looking forward to your presentation. I see you all ready to go, all that driving your slides. Uh, and if you're ready, we are. Good, thank you, Eugene, Tanya, Olga, Robert. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity uh, to present. Uh, we feel most privileged to be included in a lineup of global managers that we really respect and admire and got to listen to over the last two weeks or so. I hope today's session is gonna be interesting, productive and informative. We spoke August last year 
we introduced our global equity capability and we discussed our quality focused growth oriented investment philosophy. Today is all about performance, risk, and some practical examples of our philosophy. Olga, next slide, please. Okay, let's jump right into the performance as this is what ultimately matters. The first column of numbers on the left presents the returns for the Marzi BCI Global Equity Feeder Fund in RANDs. The next column is the, our benchmark, also in RANDs, for the MSCI Equi. The third column is our relative performance. To the right, we present our performance numbers in US dollar. Our fund is entirely invested in US dollar. Dollars paint the real picture of what's going out, going on out in the world. We have delivered real alpha well ahead of the equity benchmark. On a one year basis, we produced 12% alpha, returning 26% in dollars. On a two year compound annual basis, we are seven and a half percentage points ahead. Over three years, we're starting to open up the gap and we're doing the catch up work since inception. All of these numbers are after management fees of 80 bips all in. Olga, next slide, please. Thanks. Marzi has been around for some time. We've managed equity since 2006 and today, we manage in excess of 39 billion rand. My team and I have been in global equities for more than 10 years. We've got a consistent, long-term, above benchmark, hard currency track record. The global equity team today manages approximately 1.3 billion, and we do this for both our large institutional clients and the retail market. You can access our offering directly on the BCI platform, or via our fund in Ireland. Before I get into the details of how we look into global equity investment, I think it's important to share what our purpose is when managing global equity on behalf of investors. In other words, what do we want to achieve? What do our performance numbers stand for? What do we want to balance when we manage your money? We want to balance two central elements deliver an above benchmark hard currency return over the medium to long term and manage risk by avoiding the permanent loss of capital. Next slide, please. You might remember the stereogram craze from the 1980s and 1990s. If you stay long enough at the blurred and confusing images, order appears from the chaos, a picture emerges. Now, when you squint your eyes, what do you see when you look at global markets? Some people see a clear picture, others don't. What's your read of global markets? How's your positioning? Some get it, some never do. Next slide, please. Looking at the stereogram of global markets, we all know what will happen. There will be wars. Geopolitics will dominate the news. There will be global warming, the coming fiscal cliff, and technology is sure to decimate our way of life. Greed and fear will drive traders and investors. And in all this, all too often, the nebulous macro paralyzes investors from making good long-term investment decisions. Next slide, please. In all this uncertainty, markets will crash, guaranteed, at least every few years. Just look at the last 100 years on this slide. The next crash is just around the corner. You can bet your bottom dollar. And despite all the calamities, human progress continues apace and life does go on. In all of this chaos, thankfully, there is a lot that we can control. Next slide, please. We can find, research, and own amazing quality businesses. There are a few hundred businesses, quite different from the 50,000 companies listed out there. These businesses have durable economic moats, strong brands, network effects, unique IP, installed bases, and various other barriers to entry. Their management acts with integrity and with long-term vision, and the quality of these businesses eventually shows up in the numbers. 
Margins are wide and persistent. Capital allocation is rational, evidenced by consistently high returns on invested capital. And above all, there is long-term growth driven by the company's own reinvestment of retained earnings at high returns on invested capital. Next slide, please. When we research these businesses, we study them thoroughly to ensure that they meet the criteria of our clearly defined investment philosophy and repeatable investment process. We kick the tires, independently triangulate our views. We work like forensic accountants and investigative journalists seeking the truth and the flaws in our arguments. We, when we buy, we seek a substantial margin of safety in the intrinsic value of our businesses. This does not mean a low P, but rather an attractive entry point for the growth that we are getting and the excess profits that we expect to earn over time. Our intrinsic value must substantially exceed the market price. Our businesses must be able to compound shareholder value well ahead of our expectations. Selling too has to be a very disciplined affair. When the time comes, we have to face up to our mistakes, learn from them, and improve our repeatable investment process by incorporating these learnings. Sometimes the mistake is not ours. Something changes in the business, in the industry, in the world. We move on. Also, we want to keep on upgrading. When our investment process leads us to an investment that pretends, presents a better return opportunity, greater than our best holding, we're going to relegate the player at the bottom of our team to make space at the top. Always push up the aggregate. That is what excellence is built on. Lastly, in the words of Charlie Munger, the big money is not in the buying and selling, but in the waiting. Next slide, please, Olga. So, to bring it back to the macro, when we follow our quality investment philosophy and we find research and invest in these quality companies, this process allows us to fulfill our dual purpose, deliver above benchmark returns and manage risk. It is the inherent characteristics of our quality companies that let them survive when times are tough and emerge stronger and bolder, thriving when fear has abated. The ability by these businesses to sensibly allocate capital to the most socially useful products and services endows our companies over time with a stream of excess profits that can be reinvested in delivering the next iteration of useful and productive goods and services. Through all this, quality companies build formidable moats that provide geographic diversification, wield pricing power with sticky products and services, and relentlessly increase barriers to entry through continual innovation. The moats and beachhead of risk mitigation and wealth preservation are the drivers of long-term wealth creation. Next slide, please. Let's get into the nuts and bolts of what quality companies look like. This is Decker's Outdoor, a stock we own. We discussed it last time, but for the sake of continuity, we'll return to it. Decker's is a global footwear company. Decker's you might be unfamiliar with, but you're probably quite familiar with their most profitable brands, Hoka Running Shoes and Ugg Boots. This business is highly profitable and growing quickly between 10 and 20% per year with plenty of runway ahead. Return on invested capital is high, in fact, very high. This is an excess cash producing machine. If we reduce our investment process to just one number, just one idea, what would it be? Return on invested capital. It's the one number that sums the total of all capital allocation decisions in the life of a business. It provides a view into the heart and soul of the functioning and capital productiveness of the business. If you look at Decker's through this lens, you'll see that the company earns in excess of 30% on its invested capital. This is the green line. The cost of this capital is about 10%. This is the red line. The company is debt-free, so 10% is what you pay in America for equity capital. In general, the gap between the return on invested capital and the cost of capital is positive and increasing. 
a company is generating increasing amounts of economic value add, that is EVA. The gray bars show the EVA spread between the return on capital, invested capital, and the cost of capital. And the purple line plots the cumulative figure for the EVA spread. Think of this line as the DNA of the business and its underlying long-term profit algorithm. The takeaway from this slide is that Deckers is accelerating the production of excess profits through highly rational capital allocation and top-line growth. This is the type of growing quality business that we want to own in good macro and in bad macro. Next slide, please, Olga. Let's compare Deckers to another shoe brand business, Nike. You'll see Nike in many portfolios. Deckers, however, is growing much faster with better margins and is intrinsically more profitable. Yet, Decker sells less than 30 million pairs of shoes a year and Nike more than 700 million. On a market cap basis, Decker is about a seventh of Nike's size today. On a valuation basis, when we bought Decker's, we bought it at a 40% discount to Nike. Valuations are now similar, but we are most happy with our return so far. Where to from here? On growth and profitability considerations alone, Deckers is more than likely to double before Nike. Growing quality businesses become much more valuable with the passage of time. The choice should be obvious. Next slide, please. In delivering alter alpha and mitigating risk, our philosophy also helps us to identify what we do not want to own, the anti-quality stock. This is what you will not see in our portfolio. Here is the same picture on your screens for the return on invested capital, but for the global resources sector. In South Africa, we have a thing for mining, but this is not a way to get rich and then stay rich. For most of the time, resource companies earn less on the capital invested than the cost of the capital. The green line is below the red line. They are serial capital destroyers. Pouring money into a hole is their core business. And much like a golfer that hits a hole in one, resource companies occasionally provide investors with moments of ecstasy. This sector is the poster child for the triumph of hope over experience. Next slide, please. Let's bring it closer to home. This is Anglo's since listing in the UK in 1999 in US dollar. What a roller coaster ride. This is a very difficult picture to explain to your clients. Next slide, please. Mines and banks are all very important topics for SA investors. This is the same picture, but for global banks. Think of Barclays, Citibank, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, and such like. This crowd literally doesn't even earn the cost of its capital ever. In fact, they destroy capital to the tune of 1% a year, every year. There is no margin of safety in this. There are no excess profits, no free cash flow. When credit tightens, and it will, the crunch comes. Shareholders are knocked out first. Next slide, please, Olga. This is Citibank. At some point, it was the largest bank in the world. It makes you cry. It's never produced any real profit when measured on return on invested capital. Even before the subprime crisis, it was incapable of making money. This business has been hemorrhaging shareholder and bondholder capital for as long as our data goes. It destroys economic value between 5 and 10% a year. It looks like it's better to work for a bank than to own one. Next slide, please. This is the share performance of Citibank. You can't make it up. This is not an investment view you can stand behind. True story. Next slide, please. Risk mitigation is just one of the legs of our philosophy, but it is very, very evident in owning a quality portfolio. Our philosophy and investment process offers better returns for lower risk. The numbers speak for themselves. Next slide, please. To wrap up, we believe that our purpose is to deliver 
alpha at lower risks using our quality focused philosophy and repeatable investment process. We believe that this approach, approach will not just stand the test of time, but will also seriously compound investor wealth over time. We are personally invested in the fund. If our philosophy and message resonates with you, please get in touch. At 80 bips all in, we offer compelling hard currency performance and excellent long-term value to you and your clients. Thank you again for your time and interest. I look forward to answering your questions. Eugene, thank you. Yes, thank you for that uh, very clear message indeed. And I do like the last slide, uh, getting really good active management at, I think, very compelling fees. Uh, if I look at some of the other active funds out there as well. Uh, you've had extremely strong returns relative to the benchmark in absolute numbers, relative to POs. You can slice it any way you want to. The numbers are there, but here's my question. How dependent are you and holdings like Decker's to a strong business cycle that we know are changing given tight monetary conditions? Um, you know, Eugene, it's a, it's a good question. Um, and maybe I can answer it from a slightly different uh, perspective. Yeah. All of our companies are quite strong growers on under uh, on a, both on a revenue base and then on an underlying earnings and cash earnings um, basis. Um, and it is broad based across our portfolio. So we're not sp exposed to any specific theme, for example, just luxury goods or just tech or Magnificent Seven. Our, our performance is actually quite um, uh, broad based. Um, and our businesses really are not uh, because they do socially relevant and useful things, they keep on growing, even though uh, the overall overall economy may be receding or going into recession um, yeah. uh, to, uh, environment. So th that yeah. is how I would say uh, we look at we look at the world. We try to find exceptional businesses that do okay and good and do okay in tough times and do well in good times. Yeah, well, keep on doing that good work and keeping on finding those businesses. Uh, it clearly worked thus far. Uh, and we're going to hold you to it when we speak to you again in three months and a year from now. Thank Andreas, you. Thank you so much for your thank time. You for the time. Thank you. Go yeah, well. Really appreciate it. Right. For our next session, uh, it's all about global property. Uh, global property, as we all know, is a good diversifier in performance and portfolios. Uh, not a lot of global equity managers really look at global property. So if you do you think about the asset class, you actually have to buy a global property fund. Joining us now to unpack the opportunities in this sector and talking to the fundamentals of REITs is the specialist and none other than Greg Rawlins from Reitway Global. Good morning, Greg. How are you doing this morning? Fine. Thank you, Eugene, and thank you for that introduction. What I'm Always going... great to have you with us. We are ready for you if you are. Lovely, all ready to go. Can you see my screen? Uh, you just need to put it in full presentation mode again, Greg. Uh, yes. That display settings button at the top. Uh, just a moment. Yeah. Uh, uh, I can see your pointer going there. Uh, dispense. I'll have to go for more. Yeah, no, that's fine. Top okay, left. No, got it, there got we it, go. Got it, got it. Yeah, got it. Uh, that's it. How's that? Slideshow. All ready to go. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Eugene. And again, good morning to the viewers. I'm going to be addressing global property valuations and will, of course, address the rates. You can't avoid that, but there's some other important factors that are have implications on the current market values of listed REITs. One of them is the commercial real estate and its implications for REITs, where I will be examining what really is commercial real estate, then addressing the particular rates have that, that have the most significant impact on REITs, and finally, what the current market fundamentals are. So what is commercial real estate? More specifically, what does the financial media mean uh, when they address commercial real estate. 
simply the definition of commercial real estate is privately owned to let property that excludes listed, uh, res, uh, listed REITs and owner-occupied residential property. More specifically, this sector, the commercial real estate, has a market capitalization of $21 trillion. But in this chart, you can see they specifically and correctly define REITs as a subsector with different fundamentals, making up 10% of this $21 trillion value, uh, market capitalization or $1 trillion uh, in value. So the problem is, is that approximately 40% of the commercial real estate as defined is made up of the problematic office sector. I'm not going to go into de any detail of the sector. It's well known that there's uh, problems with low vacancies, outdated properties, and these problems can ripple through to even the banking sector, which I'll be addressing in the forthcoming slides. But something that came to, I, I extracted this uh, note from a Bloomberg article that was published on the 14th of this month, where they note that the shakeout of, uh, in the $20 trillion commercial real estate market, note they correctly separated the listed REIT market uh, from this capitalization. But to start again, the shakeout in the $20 trillion commercial real estate uh, market has been long in, uh, uh, in the ma in making and for a simple reason. No one just could not, could, no one could figure out just how to value these properties and what they were worth. And what they're meaning back is going back in history, the, uh, for instance, institutions like pension funds, insurance companies, sovereign wealth funds, we're purchasing direct property for one sole purposes, purpose, and that is the income flow, the net income flow. And they paid very little attention to the market value. And what really, they didn't really have a, a need to, or did they really want to avoid it? Um, and, more, and the Bloomberg article goes on to say, more cruci crucially, few wanted to. Now, our one of our, our associates, uh, Green Street Advisors, they are analysts that specialize in the unlisted property or the commercial real estate, as well as the listed property. And they describe this situation or this type of holder of commercial real estate as volatility launderers. Quite a, de a definition and very apt. How has this got, what has this got to do with the, uh, the banking sector? Goldman Sachs goes on to note that approximately 80% of all loans in, of, for commercial property is provided by the regional banks in the US. Now, there's a, the figures are showing that there's about 4,000 regional banks in the US, and the sector is long overdue for a consolidation. And we know that already three of them uh, were closed down or merged last year, and already uh, this year, the New York Community Bank is under the, uh, under the watch and has the possibility of going under or requiring a merger. But not only that, JP Morgan notes that these smaller banks carry, uh, have uh, 4.4 times more commercial real estate exposure than their larger peers. So obviously the larger banks are far more conservative. And this has provoked uh, Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell to predicting that more small banks will likely close or merge due to commercial real estate weaknesses. And went on to say, I think, as usual, uh, Jay Powell always covers his, his, his back, say, and he goes on to say, I think it's a manageable problem. I'm in that same, uh, uh, I hold the same view as the regulators are watching these banks very, very closely to ensure that depositors' cash is safe and uh, they have enough liquidity. And ultimately, it is the, the shareholders of those banks who will carry the can if things go wrong. I do note that of late, 
uh, the landlords uh, are getting together with these banks to reorganize and to renegotiate the refinancing. And just an anecdotal figure, for instance, um, this time last year, uh, they were predicting that the refinancing level for 2024 of these uh, of these banks, these regional banks that are exposed to this commercial property was in the figures of $750 billion. That figure now of late has gone up to $950 billion and rest assured, this has got nothing to do with them adding extra loans to their books, but more case of them negotiating refinance uh, re packages with the law landlords. Then just how has this affected the REIT sector? And I want to focus on the office REITs. You can see there in 2010, uh, the market capitalization re re relative to the rest of the, the market of office REITs was 14%. It is now down to 5% as a result of price action and also other fast growing sectors like logistics, data centers, um, and telecoms that have grown significantly over this period. And I believe that this figure this is going to decrease even further. Now, we as active managers have had no direct exposure to US office REITs for at least two years. But it may sound counterintuitive, but we have recently, over the last few weeks, started taking out a position in a US office REIT. And what belies is, is that this particular REIT has a strong balance sheet and is able to raise capital, albeit, albeit at, uh, that it's expensive. However, there is going to be an already uh, appearing uh, a significant amount of accretive acquisitions from distressed sellers of top quality or better quality offices. And this particular REIT, we believe, will start uh, uh, benefiting from this and they should show in the, in the latter part of this year. So which rates impact REITs uh, valuations? We know about central bank uh, uh, rates, we know about mortgage rates and various lending rates, but it's all about the 10 year yield, which is an embodiment of, in most countries, the risk-free rate. And here, what we have done is plotted the US 10 year yield in blue against the global property index. And as you can see, it's almost a perfect inverted performance, where as the 10 year or the risk free rate starts escalating um, uh, in, uh, in January 2022, the global property index started falling. There was instances I've highlighted in red. And even I was caught out in that, that it looked as though that the inflation rate, which was uh, plummeting from 9.8% very rapidly down to what is now known as the sticky level of, uh, of about 3 to 4%. And those were false uh, recoveries. And uh, going back to the end of this, uh, end of last year, though, however, the 10 year yield started declining from its high, and as a result, the global property started recovering. But I'd like to break open what this index, the, more particularly the global property index, is all about because there's a wide dispersion of performance around this uh, index. In any index or any average, there's the better performance, the inline performance, and the underperformers. And what we have done here is extracted uh, a, a number of sectors and calculated the mean performance total or the mean total return for 2023, which was 12%. And as you can see, data centers came in with an incredible, if not spectacular performance of 29%. That is the 12% mean plus 17%. Again, we as active managers look ahead. Yesterday is dead and gone. And we're looking ahead of 2024 in the next three, year, three years. And at this point in time, as active managers, we've got absolutely no exposure to lodging and resorts and timberland, notwithstanding that they came in with credible performances last year that outperformed the mean. 
Alternatively, we are overweight healthcare, as we believe that this is, an, our analysis indicates that we're in for an outperformance. I've already indicated that we're taking out a small position in an office REIT, it's a particular situation. And the telecommunications or tower REITs really came in with a very dreadful performance of negative uh, 27%. Here too, we have got a medium sized performance and we expect to be increasing it in the latter part of the year as uh, earnings growth starts to kick in. So what are the current REIT fundamentals? Well, I quote uh, uh, Narit, who's uh, observed that REITs are well positioned to under withstand higher REIT ra rates for longer and reflect strong balance sheets. And I want to examine what they mean about strong balance sheets. But they do go on to observe that these disciplined balance sheets are also make REITs well prepared for market uncertainty while paving the way for potential opportunistic acquisitions. So it's not just only the office REITs that are positioned to make a, a creative acquisitions, but many other sectors as well, on the basis that they have got strong balance sheets and there will be uh, many accretive acquisitions in a distressed commercial real estate uh, environment. So here we have uh, one of the components of a strong balance sheet <clears throat> is the debt to total assets. And uh, courtesy of uh, Narit, um, we have got two lines here. The first line, the dark blue, we pay little or no attention, and that's the debt to book assets. And just like commercial real estate, it's very difficult to ascertain what book assets are, and they've got little, very little re relevance. However, it's the light blue line, where it, which is plotting the debt to the market value of those assets. And at this point in time in the US, which makes up 70% of our portfolio, it is a credible 35% only. Just remember, you can go and buy, you get a mortgage of 60% on, 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 on a commercial property uh, in most countries. However, our active portfolio, that level of debt is closer to, if not slightly lower than 30%. Then <clears throat> you've also got to examine the cost and the term to maturity. As you can see at this point in time, the average is, is a mere 4%. Uh, of course, that's mere relative to what the interest rates that we pay here in South Africa. And then also the term to maturity. Um, our portfolio is close to 3% and the maturities are in line with about the 6.5%. Uh, six and a half years. So that gives uh, the REITs ample time to weather the storm, and hopefully, which is not really a strategy, but hopefully the interest rates normalize to lo lower levels. And to this effect, um, this also uh, enables many of the better managed REITs to raise what appears to be expensive capital to uh, make those accretive acquisitions. In addition, the REITs are significantly undervalued relative to the broader equity uh, market and are meaningfully below the historic medium. We've been putting this forward for a long time. And as some of the previous speakers uh, mentioned, ultimately everything reverts to the mean and it's just a case when it happens. And we believe this will occur when interest rates start declining. Further, going back in history, uh, back to the 1960s, REITs have outperformed uh, equities uh, in, after uh, periods of high interest rates uh, for the next 12 months. This is a historic performance and it's actually quite logical because when interest rate rises, um, uh, REITs get uh, declined uh, in concert. And I do need to point out more and more REITs or equity-like in their behavior uh, as against bond-like REITs. So obviously in declining interest rate, bond-like REITs perform well, but the market is starting to understand now that uh, equity REITs uh, in particular have different performance characteristics. 
finally, it's no good having strong balance sheets um, with low cost of uh, cost of interest if there's no uh, earnings. And to this effect, again, at our, our, our looking at our active portfolio, we extracted the quarterly year-on-year -year dividend growth going back to 2008. And as you can see, uh, the average is a credible 12%. And I do note that in the period, in the quarter ending December 2020, up to the quarter ending December 2022, we were confronted by the phenomenon of COVID and the onset of higher uh, uh, inflation. And the REITs held back their cash and started distributing. And you can see uh, in the next quarter, starting December 2022, up until last year, there was a significant increase in those dividends. We do expect that to normalize. And at this point in time, uh, uh, we expect that to be for 2024, at least 7%, if not 9% growth. And possibly there's still room for a surprise. But what we are really are de delivering is real returns and ultimately the market will recognize that. Thank you. Uh, I'll stop sharing, Eugene. Greg, thank you for that. Very insightful indeed. Uh, Greg, maybe just one question, and you, you did allude to some of, of um, the points that, or the questions that I wanted to ask. Uh, more specifically, if I look at the performance numbers of global property in general through 2023, uh, it does seem that global property goes through a bit of a tough time when rates are on an increasing or, yeah. or increasing cycle. Uh, you did mention, you know, the difference between equity uh, orientated type REITs, bond orientated type REITs. If you look at your holdings in your fund, are you more geared towards uh, a right easing or right cutting cycle? And what can investors expect uh, for 2024? We definitely are positioned for a decrease in rates. I must say I'm in the, in the category of uh, uh, fund managers who are humiliated by our expectations of int uh, interest rates declining. I, um, and yes, now the market is now expecting three declines rather than the six this year. Uh, I must just say, just watch out the, the banking sector, uh, particularly the region that may force uh, the, the Fed's hand if it gets uh, out of control. Uh, I think it could increase it, but I'd rather let the clever guys in the, the bond market to do tell me what's going to happen, and they interpret it and they wait it, so we do watch the 10-year, but the expectations are for a decline, and we're well positioned for a decline in those rates, and we have a far, we have a, a far higher uh, weighting towards equity-type REITs rather than bond-like at this point in time. When it turns and actually it starts getting tracked, we will probably start increasing bond-like uh, REITs uh, in time to come. Very interesting indeed. And I mean, we've all learned we can't call exactly when they're going to cut. We're not going to go into forecasting. No, it just no. doesn't work. But we know 2024 sometime possibly seeing rate cuts. Uh, but like you said, you're geared for that or you are geared for that. Question from the audience, Greg. Uh, is property still a decorrelated asset to equities? That's a yes and a no, um, because I've just mentioned that there's equity-like REITs. However, the yep. market hasn't really cottoned on to that. But it is, um, well, uh, you know, you've got to strip out the Magnificent Seven and then everything looks relatively normal. <laughs> So yes, it is decorrelated to some uh, to some extent, uh, but but it's becoming more and more correlated as more and more equity like REITs become and come into the market. But you can always seek shelter in the bond like REITs as well, um, and uh, it's really as a result of an active manager that uh, t t t delivers the result that may be equity like or bond like, and that's very important. Our objective is to outperform a credible index, which we have a credible benchmark after costs. 
And I mean, exactly to that point, it was one of my questions. You clearly answered it. You know, if you're buying to the global uh, property story for 2024 going to 2025, why not just buy an index fund? Uh, but you clearly showed why not and why you actually need active management. Greg, thank you so much for your time this morning. Uh, truly expert in the field. If you uh, do consider global property adding value to your clients portfolios, uh, reach by global equity available on all the platforms. Uh, Greg, thanks again for your time. Always great to have you with us. And we'll thank chat you. to you again very shortly. Thank you. Bye. Good stuff. Right, for our next session, Global Emerging Markets. Uh, we've had a lot of interest last week on emerging markets, and it appears as if the tide could be turning with emerging markets offering very attractive valuations relative to developed markets. And we will continue some of those conversations this morning. And joining us now is Lars Hachenbach from Riskira, based in London. Good morning, Lars. How are you doing? Good morning. Uh, thanks, Eugene. Thanks, everybody, for taking the time to uh, come and listen to our presentation this morning. Um, so, yeah, um, as you say, I'd, I'd like to spend the next 15, 20 minutes um, really doing a very, very quick walk through uh, what's happening in global emerging markets, um, our views and, and some of the key issues that are underway there. Um, we titled the presentation Investing in the Dragon's Den because uh, for those of you who follow these things, um, it is now the Chinese year of the dragon. Um, and the, the Chinese market, of course, is one of the key components of the EM index and really what happens in China, both from a market point of view as well as from a global economy point of view is, is really quite important. So um, the case for EM is, is, is relatively well known. Um, there's the huge population, uh, generally growing quite strongly and populations growing, at least in aggregate, there are certain countries where the population is uh, topped off, uh, typically lower debt levels than uh, developed markets, particularly the case for, for the Chinese uh, economy, um, usually a beneficiary of higher commodity prices through exports, uh, strong diversifier, and, and there are many exciting stock level opportunities. Um, and yet the markets have struggled, uh, particularly the Chinese market. So what is it that hurts uh, performance for emerging markets? Weaker global growth is obvious, um, but the emerging markets tends to have a slightly leveraged impact there. Um, so as a, as a supplier into developed markets, economies, uh, usually when the DM, when you stop buying you know, iPhones in, in, in the US, then um, the entire supply chain tends to be based in emerging markets and there's a, a magnified impact of uh, that, that iPhone that somebody didn't purchase. Um, higher interest rates and the resulting strong uh, dollar, that is, is an issue. Um, so why, why is a strong dollar an issue? Well, because emerging markets are typically reliant on foreign investment and foreign capital flows to keep their economies buoyant. And when the dollar rises, uh, and often that is because of higher US interest rates, then that capital tends to evaporate. People uh, in developed markets tend to keep their money at home. The, the yield pickup is not as attractive. Um, so that's that's really why a strong dollar is uh, is a problem for emerging markets. Lower commodity prices, inevitably, if you're exporting and you get less for what you're selling, then that's an issue. Risk off sentiment. Um, we've had several periods of strong risk off sentiment in the last decade. Uh, COVID being a, a particular one where there was a very strong flight to quality. People repatriated their money into um, their, their developed market uh, familiar homes. And there are uh, governance con considerations in emerging markets. Um, yeah, there have been uh, a number of, of higher profile scandals, um, weaker institutions, all else equal uh, compared to developed markets. It doesn't mean that there aren't issues in developed markets. It just means that they're a little bit more prevalent in EM. And so you need to be much more careful as an asset manager, as an allocator uh, when, when you're investing there. Um, and so unfortunately, you know, all of these five things have taken place to some extent over the last 10, 15 years. And as a result, emerging markets have underperformed the developed markets um, and, and quite substantially so. Um, if you look at the dark blue line first, that shows the ratio of the uh, developed markets to emerging markets uh, price indices. So typically when the line is rising or the, at a peak, it means that developed markets are doing well. Um, and when the line is declining, it means that emerging markets are doing uh, poorly. And so, um, we've we've seen uh, the the last really 10 12 years 
um, emerging markets have uh, significantly derated versus developed markets. Um, and you know, if you do look back, I mean, this is almost a 30, 35 year period. Uh, we we do see these let's call them mega cycles um, of ten year ish periods where the uh, emerging markets tend to diverge uh, from DM uh, a ten year period where they do well uh, to 2000 2010 and then you know the, the close on a ten year period where they do poorly um, and we are currently are close to the the bottom of that historical ratio so if anything that would suggest that there's a potential buying opportunity for emerging markets in general uh, right now. Um, the light blue line in the background is the US dollar index. Um, as I just explained, the, the dollar is a, a really a key um, uh, input factor into the performance of emerging markets. So they aren't inversely correlated. When the dollar is strong, emerging markets are weak and vice versa. Um, and for the last little while, we have had a stronger dollar for a number of reasons. Um, we've had infl global inflation has increased. That has resulted in higher US interest rates, which has resulted in a higher US dollar. And we've had a number of geopolitical uh, issues and, and COVID, as I mentioned, uh, which meant a flight to quality. So people have uh, repatriated funds from the uh, emerging markets and, and bought back their, uh, their dollars. So those all contributed to a stronger dollar. So as others prior to me this morning have uh, indicated, we're all kind of waiting for what's the, the trajectory of, uh, of interest rates right now. Um, you know, are we at the peak? Uh, how many rate reductions will there be what is the new normal um it's unlikely we'll go back to sort of zero interest rates but we know we may well go back to a, a more normal two you know, percent ish level uh in, in in global rates um so that is just, that, that really is the, the the catalyst that uh is likely to change the direction of travel of uh, the dark blue line which as i said would would mark the, the key buying opportunity for emerging markets if you're not brave enough to make that forecast, then you know it's probably an, an opportunity to start nibbling at at your global EM uh, at the moment. Um, currency, like I said, is a really important contributor to emerging markets performance, and you know almost to a man, uh, all the emerging market currencies have had a difficult uh, last ten years. These two, uh, the Indian uh, rupee, the Brazilian real, um, those have uh, not done particularly well. The Indian rupee is sort of halved in value over the last 15 years. Brazilian real uh, has actually done a little bit worse, but more recently has started to improve um, as prospects for Brazil um, have, have improved. And actually, Brazil is one of the more exciting countries in the, in the emerging markets universe right now. We'll say a bit more about that in a minute. Um, <clears throat> Chinese yuan, uh, renminbi, it, it, obviously a managed currency for a large portion of the time. Uh, so the exchange rate was essentially fixed by the Chinese uh, central bank uh, in buying or selling dollars appropriately, uh, was then made to float. But uh, there have been some political influences on the, the Chinese exchange rate uh, through the US-Chinese trade relationship and so forth to, to try and keep it such that you, know, you don't get this uh, really, really bad uh, competitive issues coming through between uh, China and the US. Um, and then on the right hand side, uh, the RAND, uh, our, our own lovely poster child, uh, which has lost a considerable portion of its uh, value over the, uh, the period. Obviously, this is, it's helpful if you're an exporter. So if you're, if you're selling uh, raw materials, agricultural products, metals, et cetera, uh, then a weakening currency is, is typically helpful, particularly for equity markets, because your product is priced in dollars normally um, and your input costs it takes a while for the for the uh, wages wage increase to catch up, um, and so for at least a period of time you do have uh, abnormal profit. So it does help for a period of time, but uh, you know the fact that your currency is weakening so much also makes it unattractive potentially for foreign investors to deploy capital to your country. So on the one hand, yes, you do have a benefit from exports, but uh, you might end up being starved of capital, and that that could be the much more important. Um, much more important element uh, in in the overall equation. So yeah, you know, so currency is is a big deal. Um, interest rates and inflation, of course, the other big deal that's out there. Um, so one thing that is true about emerging markets and and China in particular, is that they have not suffered from the levels of inflation that we've seen in developed markets. So I apologize, the slide is a bit busy, but um, look at the, the 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 bright orange line in the right in the left hand side chart, uh, which is the Chinese consumer price index uh, inflation rate um, and that's actually gone negative um, over the last six months so we've we have uh, deflation in China which has its own set of, of issues but 
Um, it, it means, for example, that you know, the Chinese central bank, should they wish to, has a great deal of latitude when it comes to um, a monetary policy, because they simply don't have the same levels of inflation. Um, and there are reasons for that, uh, not least the fact that they did a, a deal with the Russians to buy cheap oil, and so that has kept inflation in check uh, in China. Um, but there are other, other issues there too. So you know, their response to COVID was very different to the rest of the world, um, dampened consumer demand significantly. Um, there are some issues in the property sector there, um, which makes up about a quarter of the globe, of the Chinese economy. Um, so there have been, been domestic issues um, as, as much as um, imported energy prices that have contributed. But nevertheless, uh, you know, with the exception of, of some countries that are let's arguably less well managed, uh, Russia comes to mind, uh, Turkey comes to mind, um, which, which have had uh, issues with, with significant inflation and hence uh, interest rates. Uh, the rest of the EM landscape is actually quite attractive from uh, an inflation point of view. And closely connected to that, of course, is uh, what's happening with interest rates. So um, in, in some countries uh, like Brazil, which is the light blue line, uh, interest rates have actually peaked already. They've started reducing interest rates uh, in Brazil, which inevitably has, has, has benefited the uh, domestic equity market. Um, you, know, you can sort of largely ignore the gray line with Russia, uh, which is sort of the highest of the rates right now. There are some you know, quite unique issues going on there. Um, we haven't shown Turkey on the map because it would actually be, you'd have to extend the scale by, by three times the, uh, what it is right now because of some significant inflation issues in, in Turkey. Um, but nevertheless, uh, you know, as others have mentioned and I've mentioned, uh, people are waiting for what's happening to, uh, to US interest rate. That really is the, the catalyst that will drive uh, EM interest rates and hence flows and um, growth in those, uh, in those countries. Um, Earnings per share, um, there has been a divergence between EM and the developed markets. Um, a significant gap has opened up over the last 10 years or so. Um, and you know, you have to ask yourself how sustainable is that? Um, you know, at some point, either those developed market countries they need to start uh, increasing their manufacturing base in, uh, in, in the EM countries. Um, a lot of the growth in earnings, um, as again, others have mentioned, is, is due to uh, technology companies in the US. Um, but the you know emerging markets will catch up. You know, the Chinese are also making uh, phones and uh, telecommunications equipment and are spending money on uh, improving industrial production. So eventually, that uh, that gap is going to open up. Um, uh, it is going to close at least. So where it is is quite wide right now. Um, it, it certainly says you know we call it the crocodile jaw. Eventually, that's going to snap shut. Um, and uh, you know you kind of want to make sure that when that happens, you're you're on the right side of your um, a position on the correct side of it. Um, on a PE basis, you know, same thing is happening. Back you know, 10, 15 years ago, the PEs of EM and DM com companies were largely uh, comparable. Um, a gap ha did open up, has, man has been maintained. Again, much of that is due to uh, the, the very aggressive valuations of uh, technology companies in the US, which uh, a previous speaker did uh, give you some information about. Likewise, you know, is that how sustainable is that uh, going forward? Um, the other interesting thing to look at is the weights of the various countries in the EM index. Um, this is going back uh, just over 20 years. Um, the one to note is the big dark blue one at the bottom, which is the Chinese market, um, starting off at you know, somewhere close to 7-8% uh, back in the day, um, peaked at approximately 43%, um, and due to performance issues in the last uh, couple of years, is now down to 25%. But it is, it is the biggest single component of the index. Um, and therefore, what happens in China is uh, really the one of the biggest drivers of uh, the performance of that of that market. India has been making has done well um, more recently. It's now a much bigger portion of that uh, market. A little bit difficult for foreigners to access, but there are ways to do it. Um, and uh, it is it, it's certainly uh, an, a, an area of interest. Although, as we'll see in a minute, you know, we would argue that India is probably fairly valued, and in fact, probably overvalued right now. Um, you know, whereas the Chinese market, on the other hand, is, is significantly undervalued. So if you were to pick a single country out of this list um, that's showing attractive valuations, attractive prospects, well, the Chinese one is, is the one to go for. Um, and yeah, as I said, you know, the Chinese market over time, um, and, and some of that is not is due to, to the actual growth of companies in China, um, but also to the opening up of the Chinese market to foreign investors. So the 20-year the period that we're speaking about has seen a, pro a progressive 
opening up and liberalization of the Chinese capital markets as far as uh, foreign capital is concerned. It's now much, much easier to trade in and out. Um, it's easier to hold Chinese securities and so forth. So its weight has uh, increased uh, commensurately. Um, where are the other crocodile jaws that we're seeing? Well, there's this, uh, the artificial intelligence showdown. Um, NVIDIA, one of the companies in the Magnificent Seven, is, uh, as well as Microsoft, have both uh, placed heavily on, uh, on the artificial intelligence side of the world. Um, they've, they've done very well as a, as a consequence. The valuations have been driven up significantly by that. But um, the, you know, the, the two countries in the world which have the capability and interest to develop significant AI capabilities are the US and, and the Chinese. Um, and if we look at here, the NASDAQ 100, which is, you know, all intents and purposes, the Magnificent Seven or a small subset of those, um, then, you know, the, the um, valuations uh, of those companies has significantly outperformed uh, their Chinese equivalents. And, you know, you've got to ask yourself, how, how sustainable is that? Because money has been spent, uh, both government and private sector money in China. Um, and eventually that crocodile jaw is going to snap shut. And again, you want to make sure you're on the correct side with your portfolio. And the other one, which I've also briefly indicated was this, the India versus China story. Um, similar population sizes. In fact, uh, some statistics suggest that India is now actually the most populous country in the world, um, but have, have, have very, very different economies. Um, you know, India is much more fragmented. It uh, doesn't have the end-to-end -end industrial base that you see in, in China. Um, and so, you know, you also have to ask yourself, how long can a material outperformance of the one versus the other uh, be justified, uh, particularly, say, given the, the on the ground activities that we've seen uh, in those two. So, you know, India arguably is, is, is overpriced now, whereas the Chinese market is somewhere neutral to, um, to, to underpriced. Um, and uh, just putting together some stats here. So um, this is uh, um, some information from Alpine Macro. They are a very uh, respected emerging markets um, macro house. Um, they're strongly punting uh, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, basically Latin American companies, uh, countries and companies as, as being overweight. Um, and and we've, we've seen that too. So in the, the funds, the emerging market fund that uh, we have uh, on the, the platform, um, we've also done quite well out of having a, a Latin American and Brazilian exposure. And in fact, Faisal Rafi, who was meant to do this presentation in my place, he is in Brazil as we speak. Um, and and is, is reporting lots of exciting stories there on the venture capital side, um, listed equity side. You know, Brazil is is uh, is, is happy days uh, right now. Um, and on the, the under underweight side, uh, India I've mentioned a couple times already. Um, it's, it's just had a great run. Um, the, the story is is positive, but it's it's probably the prices have gotten a bit ahead of themselves. Um, and then places like Turkey at the bottom, uh, it has some very unique issues. Um, politics interfering significantly in the central bank. Um, there's, there's not really an, an opportunity there to, to benefit from that. Um, drawing it to a close a little bit, um, I said governance is important, especially within emerging markets. Um, we, as, a, as one of the preeminent multi-manager and, and emerging markets consulting firms have reached out to a number of asset managers in, uh, in South Africa, in China, in India, um, uh, to try and understand what their um, issues around stewardship on you know, how they're approaching those, what the specific uh, things there are that they're concerned with. Please have a look at our website. The reports are all available to download. It does make for some quite interesting reading about uh, the issues that asset managers are grappling with in, in their domestic markets. So to close it off, um, you know, emerging markets have, have underperformed. DMs have strongly outperformed uh, for some time now. Um, there are good reasons for that. Um, but the real question is, how long can this continue and, and when is the time where you need to uh, like switch out of uh, DM holdings and, and uh, increase your allocation to, to emerging markets? And you know, so I would suggest China in particular is the, is the one to watch there. Um, and you know, depending on how you like to play that, we have both an emerging markets and a China product uh, available via the, uh, via the BCI platforms. Um, and you know, the, key, the key catalyst really is uh, what happens to U.S. interest rates? Um, so that's the thing that everyone is watching. No news there. I think you, you know, that that's that's kind of well established. Thank you. Back to you, Eugene. Lars. Thank you very much for that. Uh, and maybe just to mention to the audience, uh, it is the Riskera BCI Emerging Markets Equity Feeder Fund. 
You also manage a China fund, uh, and we can talk through that a little bit later if there's time. But maybe quick questions from the audience. Uh, the one in particular stands out to me because we get it very often from an SA investor perspective. Uh, emerging market valuations may infer opportunity, but from a portfolio construct and risk management perspective, does it make sense for an SA investor to invest in emerging markets when they live in a, an emerging market, being SA, and most of their assets are SA emerging market exposed? Yeah, um, I think that is an important question. Um, and the, the, well, the, the first statistic to consider is um, what proportion does South Africa actually make up of the EM index? And, and as of, at the minute, we're down to about 3%. So we're not a big player in EM anymore. You know, years back, that was different. Um, so now if you're buying an emerging markets index or fund, then you are in fact getting quite a bit of exposure to other regions, other countries uh, that, that are not, you know, that are following cycles that are different to the, the South African one. Um, you know, like I said, I mean, China is 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 a little bit of a, a weirdo because, of course, South Africa has a very significant indirect exposure to China via via NASPAS. So China is is there, but you know, there's there's nothing comparable to Latin America in in South Africa. There's nothing comparable to India in in the South African market. So, as a diversifier, it 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 remains a very significant opportunity. For, for even for SA based investors. Um, and, and yes, I mean, in, in an overall portfolio from a risk management perspective, et cetera, you know, you probably want to have DM as well as EM exposure. Um, but I think that the key takeaway is that the emerging markets, so as defined by the various indices, are actually, you know, quite different to what you would get from a, a domestic South African market. And of course, there are lots of local issues. You know, the South African local market is impacted by load shedding, by local politics, et cetera, et cetera, which don't translate directly into emerge, other emerging markets. So you're going to get offsetting effects, even in the short term, uh, by allocating some of your portfolio to those. Thanks for that. Um, we've had a lot of global equity managers on these kind of discussions over the past two, three years. Uh, a lot of them fish in the pond of developed markets, be they value or quality, and mainly the US. And when we ask them, you know, what about emerging markets? Very frequently we get the answer, but a lot of the listings in developed markets, the earnings are derived from EMs. And they will say, but you don't really need to allocate directly to EM markets. What would you say to them? Um, I'm, I'm going to say that that is increasingly not the case. So um, there's there's a mindset that says your emerging markets are basically production centers for products that are ultimately sold in the developed markets. Think iPhone. I used the example earlier. It's manufactured and assembled in you know, China, Vietnam, India, or wherever Apple might happen to have factories. Um, and therefore, if you sell lots of iPhones, Apple makes a profit. Yes, their suppliers also make some money, but you could just as easily hold Apple and, and, and you kind of, it's, much, it's a much easier decision. But what has been happening over the last 10, 15 years is the, the, Im the emerging markets are trading amongst themselves in a way that we haven't seen before. So Indians are buying products made in China. Vietnamese are buying clothing that's made in Thailand, even though they make their own clothing. Like this, this intra-regional trade has become a much, much more uh, significant phenomenon over the last 15, 20 years. Um, and inside those countries, domestic demand has now become a big factor. And I'm going to use the Chinese example again, because it's, it's sort of as the biggest com component there. Um, the the you know, back in the day, if you were a Chinese consumer, you're looking to buy a new pair of trainers, you know, you're going to buy some Nike or Adidas shoes because that's what you're familiar with. It's a global brand. As an investor, you just buy Nike and Adidas. But now the Chinese are buying and demanding premium domestic products. They're buying shoes made by Chinese domestic companies. They're buying electric vehicles made by Chinese domestic companies. There are entire industries that exist in some emerging markets like the uh, solar panels industry, the wind turbines industry, electric vehicles industry that simply don't exist in developed markets. 
So there isn't a DM equivalent company that you can buy to give you that exposure. You have to actually go and look for them in the emerging markets. Lance, we are really running out of time and there's a lot of open questions on emerging markets. We are going to send those questions through to you if you can maybe reply to them as well. We will circulate that to the audience. One very last question from the audience as well. Um, China just cut its five-year uh, rates. Mm -hmm. Will this assist with the property market downturn or will consumers not resort to paying down debt instead of buying assets or the likes of property? Um, so the, the rates in China are not have not actually been so massively high anyway, so as to say, well, you know, gosh, I'm, I'm drowning in debt here and I'm going to try and pay yeah. So that's not as much of a, of a factor. And um, the property developers have been quite leveraged. So the minute you can cut rates and, and you can reduce the interest burden on the corporates, that of course okay. is cool. But it's, you know, I, I, I would say it's not, it's not like your rates have gone from 10% to 5%. Now, you know, suddenly you think, okay, wow, you know, I'm going to just get rid of this debt because I'm uncomfortable with it. Um, and sorry, just to finish the question, the Chinese also are chronically high savers. They save too much. They don't spend enough. And so if you actually reduce rates, then it, there's a disincentive to saving and hence an incentive to try and spend a bit more money. So there's that kind of impact going on as well. It's not just looking at the balance sheet, but saying, you know, the, the rates I'm getting on my savings account are less than they were before. Therefore, I'm now going to rather buy, you know, a, a new refrigerator instead of putting the money in the bank. Yeah. Lars, thank you so much for that. For that, like I said, a couple of open questions there. Uh, yeah, no, there seems to be a lot of those. interest on emerging markets. Uh, for our audience out there, if you want to know more about the Skira funds, particularly emerging markets, if you do think good opportunities for your clients, let us know. We'll get you in touch with Lars and we can get some more info through to you as well. Lars, again, thank you so much from our side for your time this morning. You were off to a bit of an early start, but I think normal time, business time now mm -hmm. uh, to start your day. So thank you so much. Right, speaking of valuations in the last session of this morning, looking at global value all the way from London and a very familiar face to most of us is Sean Pish from Ranmore. Good morning, Sean. How are you? Sean, I can see your presentation, but I can't see you. Yeah, uh, you guys. Uh, I can hear you. <laughs> yeah, Eugene, I says, there we go. Right, now I can I can start my video. Um, there we go. Can you see me now? Uh, not yet. I'm going to switch myself up. Yes. And yes, we've got you. You got, you sure. got me there. Brilliant. Fantastic. Okay, super, Eugene. Well, thanks very much for the opportunity and for um, some very interesting presentations. It's been it's been interesting sitting here in the background. So I guess it's my turn and I've got to make it try and make it as interesting as the other speakers. Um, super. Well, thanks for the opportunity. So just to kick in, you know, what are we about? Who is Ranmore? Well, we really have one belief, and that is that price matters. And if you think about anything, if you think about property, you, know, you might want to buy a high quality, wonderful property in Bantry Bay. Um, and that would be fantastic. But for you know, half a billion dollars, it wouldn't be a good investment. And so price really does matter. Um, and we'd really try and do three things. We, we try and buy value. All right, we'll talk about that in a second. If we do a good job, that creates value. And then we try and offer value to, to our clients. And so let's just go through those. How do we buy value? Well, we look around the world, and that can be in large cap, small cap, mid cap. It can be in you know, emerging markets, as Lars spoke about a second ago, and we can touch on that in a second. We, we're just trying to find value wherever it is in the world and looking for those underpriced, um, mispriced assets. And the obvious question is, well, why would anybody sell you something that you think is, that they think is, is mispriced? I mean, who, who on earth says what we do is we, we, we like to sell businesses um, below intrinsic value. And quite often it's, the, it's because of fear and greed. Fear and greed drive markets. And when people are fearful, you know, they just want that there's an overriding fear and they will sell those assets at any point in time. And, 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 and right now, if you, you know, just to touch on that emerging markets, you know, people are fearful about emerging markets. It hasn't been a good place to be for many years. 
And so um, in many cases, they're giving those away. And so we're happy to look around the world um, and uh, for those mispriced assets. And when we find them, when we find what we think is a mispriced asset, we approach it like an astute business person, okay, who's, who's acquiring a business, who will uh, a private equity type individual who's going out there and buying the business and is interested in the cash flows of that business. And we'll analyze those long term cash flow stream and decide well, what have they done with that cash flow? They paid dividends. Have they repaid debt? Have they made acquisitions? Have those acquisitions increased return on assets? You know, so that's what we try and do. Analyze the long-term cash flow, and we will come up with a, an assessment of what we think normal earnings will be. Okay. Um, and then calculate a fair value based on those normal earnings, and that gives us a potential upside. And so many times you have a look and you calculate your normal earnings and you and what your fair value is, and there's no potential upside. Well, you move on. Um, and we will avoid over leveraged businesses. And we think that's especially important right now where we are in the interest rate cycle, you know, interest rates going up and, and too many companies, especially in the US, have gorged themselves on high levels of debt, which they've used to buy back shares and now look, or make acquisitions. And now all of a sudden interest rates have gone up and their debt, um, their fixed term debt is rolling and interest expenses going up and sapping more of the profits. So we don't like over leveraged businesses It often, well, it increases risk substantially. Um, and we want management on our side. And what do we mean by on our side? Because it, it, you can get good management who are only interested in what's in it for them. Okay, and we can think of many examples there. Uh, but we want management who are good management, um, who make decent deals and and to think about things in a different way who adding always just for, with us at the center as outside shareholders and we must in, admit mistakes quickly and this is a point that uh, that few managers like to talk about most of us don't like to admit mistakes um but but we all make mistakes and and things go wrong for many reasons not only because of us you know things change a company you think have got good management go and make a bad acquisition or they act in a way that's not on our side where well, we must admit those mistakes quickly. All right, so, so in terms of creating value, if we do a good job and we've managed to beat the market, so 100 Rand, this is our flagship fund. It's on, I know it's a busy chart, apologies for that. Uh, so 100 Rand when we started is now worth 930 Rand um, compared to the, and that's compounded at 15.7% net of fees, all right? Um, and that compares to 860 Rand in the world index and 590 rand in um, for the the average peer and this is the ia global which is um which is a peer group over here in the uk and it's 550 the funds and it's all the global equity funds that you that you would be familiar with now just to put it into perspective if you have a look at and go and do your own own work i'd encourage people to go and do your own work but the average balanced fund in south africa that 100 rand has grown to about 310 rand Okay, so you can see that, you know, I know those are Reg 28 and not directly comparable, but it does suggest that for anything other than has, what has to be in, um, in Reg 28 funds, global equities are a great place to be. So three times the return, the question is, well, is it three times the volatility? And the answer to that is no. It's about it's about 1.8 times the volatility, 1.7, 1.8 times the volatility. So on a risk adjusted basis, global equity funds certainly are very attractive. Um, and if you compare it to the value index, and obviously there's a lot of talk, and we've heard that this morning with the, the value and the growth index. Well, the value index is 633. Um, and the value peers 570 and so it's perhaps a little less relevant we are a value manager but um, as you can see here in terms of the quartiles well in the top quartile uh, against all our value peers okay now how have we managed to do that will be very different and so I mentioned that we look around the world and right now what you've got here is is our weightings in the green Per, per region and the the MSCI World Index weightings and in the blue and and so you can see that you know it's over seventy percent now is the MSCI World Index and that has largely been driven by some of those very large companies the Amazons and Apples and Microsofts those trillion multi trillion dollar companies it's now seventy percent and so things are very skewed towards um, towards North America and obviously because of that we're not finding you know we're not finding value in that space because so much money has gone into the passives in that region etc the question is not 
Has it been a great place to be? We know it's been a great place to be, but what, is it a good place to invest now? And we're finding fewer and fewer opportunities in North America. And, and this is, you can see that we have um, lots of opportunities in Europe. I'll touch on one in a sec. Um, and Japan, and then just to, to last and uh, some of the other points, you know, emerging markets for us are increasingly popular. So we have this Asia other is Hong Kong, which interestingly is a part of a developed market, but yet you've got lots of Chinese companies with exposure to China there. Um, and then places like Brazil as well, we also find attractive. So um, certainly we would, and that's one of the benefits of a global fund is we're able to move around. Clients don't have to you know, redeem from one region and invest in another region. We do that, we do that for you. And just to highlight some of the opportunities. So in Europe, and it's, it's quite prescient because we have uh, one of our top 10 holdings as as readers will know from our fact sheets is a is a French supermarket retailer called Carrefour. You might think, well, that's a pretty boring company, you know, big old uh, boring food retailer. Who on earth wants that? Well, Carrefour's actually doubled earnings per share. Um, sorry, it's the fourth year of consecutive double digit earnings per share growth. So that's an interesting point. Um, they, they pay a five and a half percent dividend. They are buying back 7% um, of their shares in issue. Uh, management have been great uh, capital allocators and the company trades on a forward earnings multiple of less than eight. You know, so, so you can see that you don't, uh, the, the only place in which you can get growth doesn't have to be in the large cap tech. And there are many companies out there that have that kind of growth potential um, and you don't have to pay the crazy multiples and are also very defensive right now with everybody focused on NVIDIA and AI and all the rest who on earth thinking about food retailers and so that just gives you an example of that we can actually find these great businesses out there another example and I know we spoke uh, some of your other guests mentioned banks you know we've got Barclays in the portfolio um, and banks are derided as being terrible businesses and bad businesses. Well, Barclays was founded in 1690. So you'd think that you, you know, you don't have to be, a, if you've been a really bad business, well, you've probably gone out of business by then. Um, of course, it's been very tough in recent years for banks because their selling price, effectively the interest rates, has been really low. And it's hard, been hard to make money when interest rates are low and they're obviously making a bit more money now. And because they are shunned by many global investors, you can buy these, these businesses on very low uh, multiples. And if you also think about the one advantage of a bank is that it has annuity income. And I think that people would pay their mortgage every month or home loan before they're going to buy the new home, uh, before they go buy the new iPhone. So, you know, these businesses can, um, can actually be pretty good businesses. Uh, is certainly in a normal environment and with QE, it's been a difficult place to be. So those are just two examples as to why we find businesses like um, like Barclays and GlaxoSmithKline and Carrefour interesting in, in Europe. All right. Um, what what will also surprise many people who are new to us is we have no information technology. Now, we do have some businesses such as eBay, which is a technology uh, focus, but that's included in consumer discretionary. And you'll see we have no materials. Um, we have no utilities and we have no real estate. And we think things are challenging there. And I know Glencorp just reported tough results this morning um, and the, the market has, has acted accordingly. And so just to highlight that uh, we, we will stay away from sectors. We don't care what the web benchmark weighting is. We will only try and do sensible things with our clients' money and our own money. Importantly, we, we invest our own money in our fund as well. Um, if you look at, I mentioned, so that's regions and that's sectors. If you look at size, so about 75% of the world index is in large and giant uh, companies, and that's classified by Morningstar. We have 35% of our fund in those types of companies, and that would be the likes of Glaxo uh, that I mentioned uh, earlier. Um, Mid-size, less than 20% of the world index is comprised of mid-size companies and 5% uh, classified as small companies. And so you can see we find far more value in the mid and the small. And why is that? Well, one of the reasons is because of the rise in passives and, the, and, and huge money flowing into passives, passives are market cap weighted, generally most of the large indices. So S&P 500 will be, you know, the, the, like three of the, last, the largest five indices are S&P 500 or ETFs, and those 
you know, predominantly the large cap. So as money flows into passives, they flow into large caps and that skews things. And it means that the mid and the small are ignored. And that's where we find the value. All right. And if you look and say, well, okay, what is the PE ratio of your fund? Uh, it's just over six. So that's on a weighted average basis. What is it for the, the world index? It's about 16. Okay, and this was at the end of uh, at the end of January is okay well, but what is the estimated long term earnings growth, according to analysts, are, are you are you getting far lower earnings growth with your fund than the world index and the answer to that is no it's actually pretty similar and sorry this is the long term earnings growth not historical earnings growth and so it's both they're both about 10%. So what we like to think and of course. We need to just acknowledge the fact that there's lots of forecast error and these aren't our forecasts these are consensus forecasts but just to show that you're getting the similar earnings growth or expected earnings growth um, for a far better price and that's really what we're trying to do what um this is a i know this is a busy chart and this is really our correlation chart with against many of the the popular funds in south africa popular global equity funds we're not allowed to mention the names um because because of the rules the regulation rules over there but but you can uh you know we all know who these these funds are and because we are so different what that means is we have quite low correlation and so we blend quite well with those and so when those funds are doing well maybe we're lagging when we're doing well maybe the other funds are lagging and so what does the client get the client gets a smoother return profile um and so you can see the correlation with some of these things down to 57 percent uh all right, and and that comes through what you've got here is the Morningstar style box. And so what we have in the quadrants over here on the horizontal, you have value blend and growth. And on the vertical, you have small, mid and large. And here's our portfolio over on value mid. And that's similar to what you saw earlier. Where are most of our peers? They're over here, large growth. And so that's why you can see that we offer um, you know, our portfolio blends quite well because we're so different to many of these other funds. In terms of offer value, well, first, a couple of important points. We don't charge performance fees. Our clients get all the, the returns on their money after our fee. We have a sliding management fee. And what, we've, what we want to do there is that as we grow, we want to pass on those benefits of scale to our clients. So as we go over 500 million, our management fee goes from 0.9 down to 0.75. And as we go over a billion dollars, it'll fall to 0.6%, trying to pass on the benefits to our client. Uh, what we also have is an institutional fee class and we with a $10 million minimum, but we have made that available to all the platforms. And that is to help our clients offset any platform fees that they might incur. Um, and so we that caps the the ter at one percent for our ter at one percent obviously there's the there's a platform fee um but that as i say that uh that that does offset some of those and and another important point we have no segregated mandates all our focus is on one global equity fund and so if a client came to us tomorrow and said can you do a hundred million dollar mirror fund on the side the answer is no because we want all our clients to benefit from scale such that um, everything's in the same pot that's where our focus is and it reduces the the impact of the other costs for for all our clients so we try to offer value in that regard um, and so really in summary you know we have a very disciplined process it has been proven through many market cycles and i think you know, everybody focuses on, or many people focus on macro and what's going to happen to the world and what's going to, you know, the war in the Middle East, etc. And if you stand back and you say, we've managed to take 100 Rand to 925 Rand, um, and that has been through the global financial crisis, there's been the European financial crisis, you've had Fukushima, you've had the pandemic, you've had the Ukraine war, you've had low interest rates, high interest rates, record inflation, etc. So just by focusing on what we do on a bottom up basis and recognizing that every time there's a crisis that creates new opportunities. The Ukraine war, nobody wanted to own Europe, boom, opportunity for us. Um, we just stay focused on that. We have a very different differentiated portfolio. We think there are significant opportunities in value, small and mid caps. Okay. And right now what we're seeing is a lot more acquisitions. And so if, if growth is hard to come by globally, then one of the ways the larger companies can grow is they can buy smaller companies, bolt them on, create synergies, etc. And so we think we're very well positioned from there. Our fund is obviously available on the, the BCI platform. 
um, and, uh, and, and many of the other platforms into that. And so, um, so Eugene, if, if I, maybe I'll leave it there and happy to take any questions. Sean, very powerful presentation indeed. And I think you did answer most of the questions that came in. And I must admit, most of the questions that are coming in are more flattering than anything else. Um, at the beginning of 2023, you were very optimistic that value could outperform growth. Uh, and you had very strong views on why you do not own mega cap tech stocks by way of example. Uh, and when the Magnificent Seven took off in some of these mega caps, I must admit, I, I had my doubts, but you finished extremely strong in 2023. And I guess a lot of the questions are trying to understand that magic that you've got, but you've illustrated that very well. Maybe just one question from the audience. Uh, we are entering a rate cut cycle. We can't say exactly when it's going to start, uh, but as a value fund manager, how will this impact on your stock selection to ensure consistently good performance like you've always done? Look, I mean, we'd love performance to be consistent and every month to outperform. Unfortunately, <laughs> you know, that it doesn't work like that. Um, what we do is we we just invest in a way that we know makes sense over the long term and the performance is the performance. And if um, and so that's what we do in terms of the interest rate cut cycle. I mean, it's so focused and uh, everybody's focused on that. I think the one thing we can all accept is that interest rates are not going back to where they came from so they're not going back to close to zero and and if the i think the central bankers must be kicking themselves you know on the central bank whatsapp group they must be kicking themselves and saying listen let's not let that go back to zero interest rates because what did that spawn we had all sorts of speculation we had excess investment in things like venture capital and specs and memes and all of that. So that speculative speculation is not good for society. And I don't think central bankers are going to take the money back and take the interest rates back there. And if anything, what we saw recently with the CPI is that services inflation is now taking over from goods inflation. So we've seen goods inflation fall. But of course, wages and multi year wage increases and things like unions have become more emboldened. Yeah with with that and so that is taking over so inflation is likely to be stickier on the upside than than on the downside and um and so my would suggest that what we're in now is a more normalized interest rate environment and maybe they fall 25 bips or half a percent or whatever but they're not going back to where it was what i do think which is very important is that for much of uh the last 15 years that 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 jared mentioned where growth has outperformed value that was an abnormal period Interest rates were down there at naught. Inflation was practically naught. That period is over. And I think that's why you're seeing value do well. Now, I thought value would do better in 2023. But of course, the AI frenzy has taken over and everybody is focused on. I mean, the most, you know, more people are probably going to watch the NVIDIA uh, results tonight than watch the Super Bowl. Almost as many, let's say, because um, that is a huge focus. And, and of course, I'm sure NVIDIA are going to have great results. The question is, you know, the question is, is it in the price? Yeah. And um, and so we certainly think it's a it's a good time to be taking some of those those profits um, from some of those large companies uh, because it's going to be very hard, great businesses but hard to make money from here would be what we think. Sean, point made very clear. And thank you for a great presentation as always. Uh, it was really great to have you on our session this morning, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Eugene. Thanks, everyone. Good morning. It's a normal day as well. So thank you so much, Sean. We'll uh, chat to you again. Uh, in sessions to come. Uh, to our audience out there, thank you so much for joining us this morning. That is the end of our Offshore Investment Manager seminars. Uh, just as a reminder, next week we are starting with our national roadshows, our live sessions. We are starting on Tuesday, the 27th of February in Pretoria, followed by Johannesburg, Cape Town, and finishing off in Durban on the 1st of March. Uh, thank you to all the presenters today. Uh, really great content uh, and a lot of things to think about uh, in various sectors of the market and different asset classes as well. Uh, all the presentations, as I mentioned, will be made available on the Boutique Manager's website, as well as the recordings. Uh, if you're not sure where to find it, get hold of the BCR sales team and we'll get you to the right place. I see there was some question on data on Sean's fund not available on one of the data platforms. Uh, we'll get the BCI team to look into that as well. Uh, but the data is available on most of the data provider platforms as well. 
Thank you to you all, and we look forward to seeing you at our live sessions in the coming week, and have a great week further.